I want to apologize to all the stakeholders in uh, the TGT uh, meetings that we didn't get the notice out. And if we need to postpone any of our actions today, um, it was a, a glitch, I understand, with the, um, the clerk's office, and they feel really bad about it, but the meeting notices just went out recently. So um, if there's anyone in the stakeholder groups that, that feel like we need to postpone discussion on anything until we get more people here um, to give input, then we can sure do that. So um, hopefully you'll accept my apologies. There are people that aren't here that could have been here or would have been here um, uh, feel that, that, that we did not do anything without their input. So we'll call the meeting to order. And the second thing on the agenda is to elect a new committee chairperson. So I will entertain a motion for that. Councilman Cohen. On um, Councilman Harmon's behalf, I nominate um, Councilwoman Elaine Schwartz to be our mm -hmm. chair. I would second that motion. <laughs> A little bit of reluctance I will accept it because I feel that we have a new council person that's going to be doing a good job maybe next year so as our chair and I know um, Richard has been chair of this committee and I think I'm on my going on the third year of this so um, I'll go ahead and accept it for this so um, would all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. So it, it, that motion passes um, so then we have the minutes to approve as number three and if you haven't had a chance, I don't know, Councilman Emerson. Uh, yeah, yes, I did. You had a chance. Yes. Um, and then I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. I motion we I move we approve the minutes. Okay. Second. Uh, okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 So that passes unanimously. Um, then the next thing is to review the proposed 2017 transient guest tax fund budget, and I'll turn it over to Nikki. Okay. Thank you very much. I will may go into a little more detail than normal just um, on behalf of our new committee member. Um, but as a refresher too, I think it's always helpful to go into the detail I'm gonna go into. It's I think a little bit confusing and it's new as of 2016, how we're splitting the current 7% um, TGT tax. So I think every time we can reiterate and make sure that we're all in understanding is really beneficial. Um, but just as a little bit of background, um, we do usually review the next year's proposed proposed budget around this time and the purpose for that is so that when the council gets their proposed budget for the entire city for all funds it can include a budget that reflects what the TGT committee has uh, approved so that's the reason for this timing um, as far as for the approval as you alluded to if you didn't feel comfortable voting on it today um, you do have a little bit of time I'd say we'd want the approval to happen probably before about June 3rd so we would want um, another meeting pretty quickly scheduled so that it can be approved before the budget book is finalized. Um, and last year, that's actually about how it went is there was one meeting about the same time, actually it was May 20th to review, and then I think on June 2nd it was approved. So um, I just, I don't want you to feel like there's any pressure today. Of course, an approval would be uh, great today, um, but it doesn't really absolutely have to happen today. Um, so just uh, as way of background, do you have a general understanding of the TGT tax that we collect and why? And yes, it's basically it's also a bed tax also, yep. right? Uh, yep. Added to your, to your hotel stays. Uh-huh. That's exactly right. And actually our rate um, as of uh, last year is uh, 7%. It's been 7% for quite a while. And I'll go into how that 7% breaks down. Um, Overall, I'd say this 2017 budget that you see in front of you, and there is copies um, as you walk in for everybody in the audience if you didn't get it. The 17 budget continues the splits that we established in 16. I'll explain what that means, but we aren't proposing any major change in how we're allocating any of this out as of last year. So if you look at this sheet in front of you, um, we have two years of actuals, which is standard in all of our budgets. We have uh, the 2016 projections, which have been updated, and then 2017 budget. Um, this tax, as I said, is a 7% tax. We consider 5% of that the TGT base, um, and the base is generally used for support of uh, tourism activity as state statute allow as a lot as state statute allows most of that goes towards visit Topeka 
um, to support tourism activities in the city. That's very common of cities in Kansas that they allocate the majority majority of it to a visit to Topeka or a chamber, something of that um, something of that nature to do most of the tourism activities and promotion in the city. In addition to that, um, traditionally we have had um, a one percent um, extra tax to support what used to be um, historic types of organizations. So that actually expired in 15. And what that supported, as you can see down below, is the Great Overland Station, the Riverfront Park, and then the Historic Preservation Fund. And the Historic Preservation Fund, actually that was an agenda at the last meeting, that was <coughs> then granted out through a process run by uh, Mr. Feinder here to different groups that apply. Um, as of 2016, that 1% per council resolution was expiring, and so this committee, along with the council, decided they wanted to continue having that 1%, but wanted to reallocate it, which we'll walk through. That's that new 1% allocation on the bottom. In addition to that, there's a 1% that was that's been dedicated towards the Sunflower Soccer Association. I think that resolution passed, was it 2012, Brandon? Yeah. Um, 2012 council, uh, there was a request made by the Sunflower Soccer Association that in order to support this activity, which would be a great tourism driver in the city, they would need some funds from the city. So each year, 1% of our funds actually go towards, um, part of it is for projects for the Sunflower so Soccer Association, and then part of it is to assist um, in helping to pay pretty much their debt payments for the facility. So there's the... There's the overview of how the 7% splits out, and we'll walk through a little more detail. So I won't take a whole lot of time talking about 14 and 15 unless you all have questions, but pretty much this details here how it was split out, especially as you can see down in the historic preservation in 14 and 15. Those groups um, got money in 14 and 15, and then as you can see it drops off in 16 and 17. Um, Generally in 14 and 15, I think you can see that we got a little bit of a revenue bump from 2014 to 2015, but it was pretty modest. So because of that, our 16 projections are actually, o overall they're a 2% increase off of 15 actuals, and then 17 is a 2% increase off of our 16 projections. Um, the way that this fund works is the more money we make, the more money that we give to our recip recipients based on the percentage. So. Um, if we make more than we think, if it's a great year, we have lots of people staying in hotels, that's a great thing and everybody gets more. If we get less, everybody gets less. So um, that's how the allocation breaks down. Let's take a few minutes walking through the 16 column, if that's okay, and I'll go through it from top to bottom here. We have updated the 16 projected revenues to be 2% increase off of the 2015 numbers, which would be about a $2.596 million revenue in 2016. Um, we've only received one distribution so far this year, and that first distribution tends to be pretty low. Um, and we talked about that a little bit in the last meeting. Brett got up and talked a little bit about how he and hotels see the same trend, that first distribution tends to be low, and of course summer months tend to be a little bit higher. So we base this on the full year of 15, the 2% increase. And again, if we do better than this, um, that's great news. That's great news for all of our entities, and if we do worse, then everybody gets a little less. If you go down then to the expenditures, um, the way that the formula works, Visit Topeka gets 79% of the TGT base. The Visit Topeka bid fund gets 11%. And then skipping down a few rows, um, the Topeka Zoo gets 10%. Um, that Visit Topeka bid fund split, you can see it increases from 15 to 16. That was per request last year made by Visit Topeka that they actually needed more money in that fund we actually increased that percentage. So you'll see we continued that increased percentage going into 16. And that's um, uh, the pot of money that they use to, um, they can use it to attract certain events and kind of offer incentives. And uh, luckily we have Visit Topeka here today if you want a little more detail on how they spend their money. Mm -hmm. um, they send us quarterly and annual reports every year. Um, so they can give you just about as much detail as you want about how these expenditures happen. It used to be that this TGT committee actually um, granted out additional grants out of that money. So um, this committee used to hear presentations from groups like um, Heartland Park, from other tourism groups, would act, from the Expo Center, would get up here, make presentations. 
and we figured out just to be more strategic with the funds, it made more sense to give that pot of money to Visit Topeka, who then can make allocations out as necessary and to make sure that our, our efforts in tourism in the city are really coordinated and not too piecemealed. Going down the 2016 lease, the Sunflower Soccer Association, we're projecting them to get about 365000 in 2016. And then this admin fee, that is um, per the state statute. The state actually keeps a portion of money from our TGT funds um, to operate the TGT, uh, basically to process our money. And then if you go down to transfers, as you can see, the Railroad Heritage, which is the Great Overland Station, Riverfront Park, and the Historic Preservation Fund, th those actually are zeroed out. So in 16 and 17, there's no more additional funds going into, into these groups. The Topeka Zoo, as you can see, um, is projecting to get about 181,000 and then just slightly more than that in 16 or in 17. Um, what that is, is that's actually a transfer into the general fund since our Topeka Zoo is funded by our general fund. If, if we want to support the Topeka Zoo, then it actually gets transferred into the city budget. Um, this is very common of other cities that have uh, TGT funds that have tourism operations or departments um, to use some of the money to fund some of their own operations. And then going down to the 1% allocation, this is the part that's the newest to this group. So um, I would say this has been a year uh, working on this allocation and is still a work in progress. Um, the background here is that when this committee and the council agreed to extend the 1% that used to be used for historic preservation, um, they opened up a process to decide how to allocate out that money in the future years. Um, so after, a, um, I'd say, a really extensive process, um, we had multiple committees with outside agencies representing um, review these applications. They all stood in front of council meetings, in front of committee meetings, um, uh, and then were finally approved in the fall. Some of these actually are still going to be coming forward to council with development agreements that specify how and when this money will be used. Um, but for now, what you see on the page represents the allocation that was approved. So for example, the downtown plaza, um, in total, uh, they'll get about 3.4 million, which is 72% of that 1%. The Evil Knievel Museum is 6.2%, uh, which is 300,000. The Jayhawk Theater is 680,000, which is 14.26%. And Constitution Hall is 355,000, or 7.44%. I know I said those really quickly. I can give you a lot more background there, but that's how <coughs> Uh, we came up with those numbers there for 16. So luckily, since we went into some detail there, if you go to the 17 column, that carries over. Every percentage split methodology <coughs> that I just explained carries over to 17, other than we're adding 2% increase. One more thing that we add when we're doing the next year's budget is you'll seek that contingency line. All that that is, is that's a buffer. That is... Um, increasing the total expenditure authority of the TGT fund so that if we get more money, and I think this was a 5% we built in, this allows us to spend it. Um, per budget laws in Kansas, we, have, we work with council to set a maximum expenditure authority, and if we ever need to go over that, we have to come with to you for a budget amendment. So from the start, we like to build in a little bit extra. That way, if we get extra revenue, we can go ahead and allocate it out without coming to you and having a budget amendment. If we get more than this additional 132,000, um, we will do a budget amendment, and this is one that's very easy to justify. It, this would be a great story. This would say we did better than the two percent, we did better than the five percent, we were doing awesome. Um, so, so if we do better than this, there is a way to get around it. But this gives us what we think is a pretty realistic buffer. And as you go down the line, there you can see that all of the splits are um, incrementally more than in the 16 column. Um, just based on the increased amount of revenue. So I'm sure there are questions. Would you all like to ask questions now or open it up? You can ask questions now. Uh, could you remind me again, when, when does the tax officially end? Um, the 1%, the new tax? Mm -hmm. The new one. Okay, was it 12 or 17 years? The tax ends in 12 years. 12 years, yes. yep. Sorry, thank you. And the one percent for Sunflower Soccer was began in January. Collections began in January 2013. I believe that was a 20-year tax. Do 
Um, I, I do, but some of these are just about probably the expenditures and the allocations, and and that's probably honestly things that I probably need to kind of do offline, so I'm not sure. spending two hours asking you guys questions here today. But um, I, so I do have questions, but I'd, I'd like to research some of these individual things first, so I can. Okay. Well, to give you a little bit more uh, historical perspective of, of how we've come to where we are, um, in the three years that I have been involved with this committee, I've learned a lot that, that the process is always evolving. I asked Beth Fager, how did you get the 1% for the Overland Station? Um, because Beth was the, the leader carrier for that, for that 1%, and she said at the time they just went to the council and asked. Um, the, I think the transient guest tax was coming on board with a lot of cities and they were determining how they were gonna spend it on tourism and so that was one of the questions. And then the same thing kind of happened with Sunflower Soccer that they got the 1%. So I always look at it at 511. So we have the 5% that comes in that generates money that goes to um, visit Topeka and then we have the 1% that was for Sunflower Soccer and then we ex the 1% for Overland Station ended and then we developed a new process to, for that 1%, okay. and that 1% is this 1% allocation. allocation down here. And the way we did that then last year was we took, much like what we did for the historical preservation grants that Bill Flyander helped and his staff helped put together, we figured out how to get <laughs> applications for extending this 1%. So we had 15, 16 applications for this new 1%. And we refined it into a process and invited the, the stakeholders, the experts, to um, be on a committee that actually chose then these, the downtown plaza, Evil Knievel, Jayhawk, and Constitution Hall. And those stakeholders was Visit Topeka, downtown uh, Topeka, um, Shawnee County Historical Society, David Heinemann's the president of that, and he was on that committee. And Bill was there, and Nikki and Brandon, and we had, how long did you meet? Six hours, seven hours? <laughs> to discuss how this was gonna be done. And so it was a committee process to do that, and then we took that to the council. So that kind of gives you a, a background of where okay. th this committee has been and where it's evolving um, okay. to, which I did a little bit of research when we had this process of getting this 1%, and how we were gonna dole it out, and found that many cities actually just give it to their convention and visitors bureau, mm -hmm. like visit Topeka, visit Wichita, visit Kansas City, um, and they actually dole it out. There was a couple that had a commission um, that they had council members on the commission and they helped to decide where it was gonna go. One thing I wanna mention is that three years ago, we had Heartland Park on here as getting part of our tourism <coughs> dollars, our TGT dollars. And since they're a private entity now, they aren't on here. So I think that was about around 300,000 that we gave to them. And then we decided, well, we'll just give all the money to um, visit Topeka and then they'll figure out how it's gonna. And so far, I think everybody seems to be happy with that. And I met with Brett the other day and said, if this is process is working, everybody's gonna seem seemingly be happy to to uh, work with Visit Peak on how that, that those funds are doled out. So if you look, we get 2.7 million in, and if you're counting the contingencies, we sp spend out the, the full amount, the okay. 2.7 okay. million. So um, that's the process with that. One other thing I kind of wanted to help you understand with the 7% is, and I'll probably call on Brett to come up and, and do that, where do we stand, where is Topeka? in Kansas based, I mean, is Wichita higher? Is sure. Overland Park higher? Uh, what's, is Salina, what's, is there 7%? So Brett, can I call on you to come up and just kind of off the top of your head, tell, um, tell us where exactly Topeka is at with the 7%. Good morning. Uh, so Topeka at 7%, we are really right in the middle Pretty good, I think. Uh, we're pretty right, pretty much right in the middle of of uh, the whole city and, and our location, our region. Um, Wichita, Kansas City, uh, they're they're a little bit higher, but they're bigger markets. Um, competitor cities like Lawrence and Manhattan and Salina, uh, Hutchison, 
uh, cities like that, they're they're a little lower or right at 7%. So uh, I know from our standpoint, we feel pretty good being right there in the middle. We're, we're not Kansas City, but we're, we're bigger than, than Manhattan as well. So being right there in the middle. Um, Wichita does have a lower actual transit guest tax rate, but they have a 2.5% uh, tourism assessment that puts the total at 8.5%. So they, and they just did that about a year and a half ago. And Brett, if you could kind of give a little historical perspective of tourism in Topeka, that we have a tourism alliance that, that the Visit Topeka started. Mm -hmm. um, at, we have the Lodging Association. Mm -hmm. Kurt Young is the president of that. I don't see Kurt here, but they're very, very involved in the process because they're the ones that, that collect the tax. Mm -hmm. So um, they were the ones that basically came up with the downtown plaza that was um, they made an application for. Yeah, so. the, ho the hoteliers, yeah. Around 2005, uh, the, there, there used to be a lodging association, but it, it essentially went defunct. And around 2005, some of the local hoteliers uh, kind of banded together and, and brought that organization back. And they've been pretty strong for the last 10 years around the community advocating for different things, such as the public plaza. How many hotels do we have in Mount There Hills? are 30, 32 hotels in the city. If I may ask, the, now the percentage is important because when you guys go out and try to attract conventions or things to bring in, that puts it'll put us at a, I guess, a disadvantage if we're a lot higher than other cities. Is that correct? Yes. You know, if you talk about a seven percent tax in Topeka, and then you also uh, for those hotel room nights you have to add on the sales tax as well, so you're looking at a 15, 16, 17 percent total tax. So if you're a convention that's bringing in. 200 room nights into a hotel for three straight nights you're at a hundred dollars you're paying 16 percent on top of all that money so it really adds up so uh, looking at, at where we are compared to what our competitors are that's a big chunk of change that uh, convention and meeting planners uh, and, and even ball uh, uh, groups that put on ball tournaments and sporting events look at uh, because that's that's not uh, something that they can uh, unaccount for and you feel s since we're kind of right in the middle uh, seven percent is uh, not hurting us. It's we maybe. feel yeah we feel really good with being right there right now. Right. Our, now in Topeka, our sales tax rate is a little higher than some other communities as well. So overall tax, we're pretty much right there with some of the Kansas City and the Wichita area because our sales tax is higher. So if we were to increase our transit guest tax, that might put us up over some of those cities, and and some of the some of the amenities and 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 uh, so forth in some of those cities are better than what we offer in Topeka. They're a larger city, so putting us at a higher tax rate for a convention coming in when we don't have as much to offer as some of those cities would put us at a disadvantage. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. So. Since, and you see the zeros over here in the um, Historic Preservation Fund, you know, the 1% the that we extended for historic preservation goes to, you know, the evil Knievel is historic. <laughs> Um, Jayhawk Theater and Constitution Hall. But do you foresee that in the future, maybe not this year or next year, but down the road? I mean, I know that we had applications, and when we had the fund, we dispersed in money even out to Topeka High School for their, they put in an application for their display cases, and they are open by appointment for tours. Um, we also gave money for the first time to which church? Presbyterian uh, church. Central Park Congregational, I believe. Who had a stained glass window that needed to be um, fixed, and we've also given money to Jayhawk Theater for their. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, and so we've given out money for the historical purposes. I guess my question to you, Brett, is: Do you foresee that? because the Historic Preservation Fund has ended, that we're gonna be oppressed or people will come forward to say, how can we get funding back for historic preservation in Topeka? I would assume so. I can't speak for them, but I, I know that uh, some of that money was very important to some of those uh, smaller attractions and entities that they uh, relied on some of that money for some of their upgrades. I would, I would assume that they're going to uh, be concerned with where some of that money could come from. Um, I know on our on Visit Topeka standpoint, there are a lot of things that 
we are trying to do to increase the marketing and promotion of some of those events that will help draw more visitors to there to, to help supplement their, their income so maybe they can do some of it on their own, but that's gonna be difficult for some of them depending on the size of them. So that's something that we should keep in mind for future reference that, that we may be approached to do that again. Yeah. So, okay. Is there anything else that the committee has? Thank no, you, Brad. I, I do have just a couple comments uh, real quick while I'm up here, if that's fine, about, about sure. the budget. Um, looking back at 2015 when the budget was proposed and, and uh, agreed upon, the, the budget was $2.687 million. The projection is a little low right now. You see for 2016 the projected, uh, projecting that we're a little low behind pace, but uh, from a hotel standpoint right now, we're, we're looking pretty good. I, I think I would be comfortable saying that we're going to reach that budget, actually. Um, I just looked, we just got a citywide report showing hotel revenues in the city uh, here two days ago. Uh, I'll read those numbers off. Right now, uh, we are exactly $968,000 ahead of last year in terms of hotel revenues in the city. Uh, most of that was April. We just finished April as a city, $800,000 over last year. Uh, it's very good, very good month. And May is, uh, I've talked to a couple hoteliers and they're, having, they're on pace to have some record breaking months in hotel revenue. So uh, again, that's not just good for the hotels, that's good for uh, everybody that gets any of this money that, that pool increases. So uh, right now as a city, we're feeling pretty good that we can actually achieve uh, that 2016 budget and, and looking forward to 2017. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Is there anybody else that wants to speak to the 2017 budget that we've got before us? Is there any comments or um, is there anyone that feels that we need to wait to vote on it since we haven't got all the stakeholders here um, that usually come to our meetings? Mr. Swartz, um, I would love to just study a little more. And I, and first of all, thank you, thank you for the history you gave me. And and I followed it in the newspapers the, the process. And I don't in any way want to mm -hmm. reinvent that process. Okay. I, I think you guys did a very thorough job. I would though just, you know, some of the numbers up here. I just I would like to have a better understanding before okay. I just. Uh, yeah, okay. please. Yeah. yeah, and that that's not a problem when. Um, can Nikki or Brandon, can you st indicate when we need to have this vote to make sure we get it before the budget process or starts or? Sure. <laughs> Council Member Schwartz, um, as I indicated, um, around that first week of June, so the week of Memorial Day would be ideal because that way when we release the proposed budget, that'll go to the council around June 10th. Um, that way it can 100% reflect what you all are recommending. Um, if it, you know, if it had to be into that second week of June because of schedules, uh, that I think we could work that out maybe possibly before June 9th. That way, when we release the proposed budget on the 10th, it can, I mean, we can do a last minute update to that. Uh, but I'd say ideally, if pretty much two weeks from now, if that works for you all, we can look at schedules, that would be ideal. The sooner the better. I mean, okay. if you all want it next week, that's fine too. I'm available next week if that works. Angela <laughs> and Angela uh, okay okay so we will then postpone we um, will not vote this time on uh, uh, approving the 2017 transient guest tax fund budget which is number five so um, our next thing on the agenda is discussion of Topeka home of signs on the interstate and I'll turn that over to Bill Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, um, I'll give a little bit of background on this, and then we also have um, Scott uh, Gales uh, and, uh, to represent on behalf of the requester for for this today. So I'll I'll get a, I'll get it kicked off if that's if that works. Um, okay, you may not know this. Some people may not know this, but we have a home of sign. Um, along the interstate uh, currently and I, I handed out there a map a map to show you um, we actually have at the west I-70 
Uh, city limit sign, there's a helm of sign for astronaut Ron Evans. This was, from our understanding, was put up um, in the heyday of the Apollo program um, back in the early 70s. In fact, uh, uh, quick side note, I think he was the last, um, on the last manned mission to the moon um, and was the last person to orbit the moon to date. So, If I may, uh, Mr. Finder, a graduate of Highland Park High School. A Captain Ron Evans lived in Highland Park. And a uh, great guy, Apollo 17, uh, command module pilot. Yeah, that is correct. Um, thank you. That's um, and so this is not necessarily um, actually this from from our from our research, the city um, had had never uh, requested a, a sign per se. Uh, these were put up all over the country uh, during the heyday of the of the s uh, space program by uh, by NASA and by the federal government. So these went up everywhere. If there was an astronaut from your hometown, they went up. <laughs> That's uh, so fast. Uh, well, fast forward 40, 45 years later, um, we uh, and I didn't know many uh, much of this. So there was a request uh, that came forth to the city to look into putting up a home of sign uh, for Harry Colmery, the author of the GI Bill, a extremely most probably most important legislation ever passed in, in America. Uh, and his, he had roots here and, and a home here, and so, um, and I'll, I'll let, I'll let the Scott and others talk on, on their behalf. So my job was really to go out and kind of figure out, well, gosh, how do the, how do these, how do these things, can, can they get up? How do they get up? What's the process for that? So we've been working with KDOT. KDOT does control that. Um, basically, uh, and that's, and I handed out, um, I think on the back of the map, is on the back side, you can see the policy that KDOT has. Um, they recognize, they allow each city, if you have an interstate or expressway going through your city, um, to have one home of sign uh, for one individual. Uh, I don't know if that means only one sign. Uh, we're still trying to find that out. But certainly, one individual can be recognized on that sign. Um, any request to uh, to have a in, an individual on a home of sign does have to come from the city council of that city. So that's that's something that we're we're um, planning on trying to trying to uh, put forth for consideration uh, one way or the other. So um, again, the, the the rules are, are fairly um, uh, narrow, um, and, and it only. It, the request that came forth then hence means we could only have one person up um, along our interstate. Uh, so that, that ultimately would mean the removal of, of the Ron Evans sign for a Harry Colmery sign. So that's, that's really what the issue would be here. I don't think anybody would ever argue the significance uh, of either of those two individuals. So from a policy standpoint, that's what's going to end up, um, that that's what would come before the body eventually. And, and if I may, it has to be because there, there are multiple signs, right? So you're talking about every place someone comes in the city, and it has to be the same person on the signs everywhere. <laughs> so I, I, I met, thank you. Uh, um, I, I did not have an answer from KDOT yet as to as to if every one of these signs can have a person's name. Um, as you see on the map to date, we only there is only one sign put up by KDOT. There are other entry sign, city limit signs, and I've, we have asked if those could be recognized as well. Um, it is, we don't have that answer, but it is clear from, from their answers and from this policy that only one individual at this time could be accommodated. Okay. Um, so I think, I th unless you have any questions about the process <coughs> moving forward, um, so, Bill, is this a state law or a federal law that we only have <coughs> one home of sign? Uh, yes, Madam Chairwoman. The the name having one name um, is a is a state is a state policy. What the sign, how the sign reads, is a federal policy. So, for instance, um, it can just say home of and then the individual name. 
even though there's astronaut on the one we have now. If, if Harry Comrie wants to go up, uh, it, the policy is to just have home of Harry Comrie instead of home of Harry Comrie, author of the GI Bill. So there's no extraneous information other than the person's name and home of. And that is a, that is a federal policy that the state that the state administers and interprets, yes. So if we wanted to, <coughs> we would have to like go to the league to try to get, if we wanted to have two home ofs. I, I think it's an appeal through, uh, from our understanding, appeal through KDOC uh, for variance. So is this a, is this a statute? It's a regulation, right? It's not a statute. I don't believe it is a statute. Okay. <coughs> And that's a possibility that we could we, we could look at the idea that mm -hmm. why are we limited to one? Um, yes. And of course, the Bank of KDOT is no longer the Bank of KDOT, right. so we'd have yeah. to probably wait <laughs> yeah. um, to do that. But the other thing that, that a question that I had was, I know a lot of cities, like in Kansas City, there's the Herman Dillon Traffic Way. And it's named after somebody that did a lot of things in Wyandotte County. Um, can we name traffic ways or can we name streets mm -hmm. that then KDOT would put the sign up? We, we can, we have a, our own process within the city to name facilities and streets that we go through. Um, if it's a, if it's a high, if it's a KDOT street or KDOT highway, we would go through them. I we haven't looked into the K dot uh, uh, type of type of rename, but for city streets and for city facilities, yes, we you you can do that. There's a process laid out in the code and, and that, that how you go through that. Um, so we can do that. It it, it does it does take it does put the onus on on the requester to to um, and there's there's a meeting of the neighbor. So if you're doing a local street, you have to mm -hmm. notify people because if you're changing the street name, that's that's a big deal. Sure. If you're just memorializing a, a facility or a, or a bridge, we do have that. We have some bridges that are like <laughs> that. That's not a. We're not changing the name. It's, we're just adding a name to the bridge, um, uh, which is a facility. So that's that's not as, as big of a deal. And then changing a street name, yes. So that's a possibility of if we did change the home of um, Ron Evans to the home of Harry, and I can't ever pronounce his name <laughs> even though I've worked with the VA for many years, um, that we could say that we're, we'll switch the name over to a bridge or a significant. Um, yes, you, you can honor, yes, that is, a, that is, a, that is a, an option to, to, to not remove altogether uh, the, the significance of that person you can right. and, and honor them in another way that's appropriate yes okay. then, then a sign on west i-70 okay. okay but that's that's a good good point okay uh -huh. scott do you want to come up and tell us some more about the change madam chairwoman thank you for having me my apologies i'm uh, suffering through a little bit of a summer cold and then I yelled a little louder than I should have at my daughter's softball games <laughs> last night. So it's gotten the best of me. So thankfully we have a microphone. So um, Did she win? Uh, they did, fortunately. So I've got that to, to go with. Congratulations. <coughs> Commissioner Emerson, welcome. Thank you. Council member, I'm sorry. No, no problem. Yeah, thank, thank you. Welcome to the. Tony is fine too. Yes. <laughs> um, my associate, uh, Jackie Dieterker is handing out to you, just kind of to give you a little background on this, just a very diagrammatic uh, rendering of the park that is in construction on the west side of the 900 block of Kansas Avenue. And if you were to go down there today, they're actually placing the stone benches so you can start to get a feel for the context. So this is a very exciting event. I'm speaking to you today on behalf of Pat Michaelis, who's been our fearless leader in this endeavor to recognize Harry Colmery, the and it seems insignificant to say the author of the GI Bill, when in reality you should say the author of the GI Bill, probably the most impactful piece of legislation in this century, if not in the existence of our country because of the impact it, it had as a philosophy as our country. We officially started doing things on behalf of our servicemen and women as they returned and their families, which really to the 
to the you know greatest extent created the modern middle class it allowed them to come back and become professionals and other things so anyway to that point uh, Last year, we, uh, we were contacted by the American Legion when it was n uh, noted that Harry Colmery had become <coughs> part of our notable Topekan list as part of the Kansas Avenue project, which is uh, to be wrapped up here uh, in the next six weeks. And uh, as a notable Topekan, we wanted to recognize him with a sculpture if we could, so we set out to raise about $50,000 and do a bronze sculpture of him. Well, in the course of the year and Pat's leadership, that $50,000 has grown to well over $400,000, uh, which is amazing, and uh, in part because the American Legion has kind of owned this opportunity to celebrate Harry Colmery, who was their national commander in the 1930s. And as a you know, practicing attorney in Topeka, he uh, was able to kind of lead with his connections this effort to make the law become the law of the land. So the park, this concept, will recognize him as an individual and he will be in his kind of uh, American Legion National Commander's uniform, and he is saluting a, um, a ball relief panel that'll be about nine foot wide and seven foot tall, and you can see there's actually two of them in this park. One panel will have the uh, six main services represented with servicemen and women in uniform in kind of vintage World War II era um, um, fatigues and, and uniforms. And then across from them will be their their civilian inverse. They'll be the same ser servicemen and women assimilated into civilian life with kind of a cross section of Americana <coughs> becoming the modern America as we know it today. So it's very exciting. There was a lot of involvement in this and it really helped highlight the importance and significance of who Mr. Colmery was and that as a community, how we have kind of fallen in our effort to recognize those that have gone on to make a big effort. And this has been meant in no way to to show that the significance of Mr. Evans is any less or any more. Uh, we would hope that we could add more highways so we could add more of these home of signs eventually in the future. But if we were able to do something in conjunction with what is there for Mr. Evans, we would love nothing better than include uh, Mr. Colmery's uh, name on a home of a sign to be placed out here. So um, we're bringing you this information and our request for your consideration and obviously we do so again with all the greatest respect of Mr. Evans and we would hope we would do nothing to kind of uh, reduce his significance also but if we, there's a way we can do uh, <coughs> both that would be awesome so with that I'll stand for any questions you might have great job oh, well thank you yeah, we Good do. luck with your decision making process. I like the process. term notable Topekans. That is really, that's neat. Well, it's, um, I, I think the thing that came out of it, I've lived here 23 plus years and I love history and I was kind of embarrassed at how much I didn't realize Topeka has some very notable, notable. citizens that we should do a better job of celebrating. And I think the more we are aware of them, the more we can be proud of what we've historically been able to accomplish as citizens and what our potential is. So. Anyway, thank That's you very great. much for your consideration of this. That's great. Thank you. Um, I would, since we're going to be meeting in two weeks and this is a new topic, I don't know, do, do we need even a motion? Um, what is our motion going to be about to do, Bill? Uh, the, the, this has to still get to the, uh, to the council oh. for, for, for approval of, of the of a resolution. So y y you don't you don't have to other pass this out of here if, if it, it's a it's a discussion item, but it is something if you want to lend your recommendation to you you certainly can. It, there's no there's no legal requirement to do that. Well, as chair, what I'd prefer to do is to put this if we're going to meet again in two weeks, put it on the agenda again since it is now being brought to the surface, um, and see if we have anybody else that wants to testify or say a few words about what they feel that way we'll get more public input um, and at the same time if there's any you know especially if Ron Evans was from Island Park if there's a street or a bridge or something that we can move his name to um, yeah, absolutely that that would be a good solution to you know absolutely I and uh, Mr. Finder I, I didn't know from what you've given me here um, First of all, I, I absolutely love this. Thanks, thanks for doing this. Um, 
my only my only question is you can't add any identifying information is that correct you couldn't say Arthur of the GI Bill or is that my understanding <coughs> you, you you can certainly ask what we have been told but you can see here that yeah by yeah, Paul, yeah it appears all you can say is his name and uh, uh, you can ask to see if there's a there's a there's a variance to, to that okay. uh, and appeal to the, to the secretary but that's okay that's just a shame because a great ideally yeah put what you want in it and then go to KDOT for approval okay well we have home of astronaut so we could say home <laughs> of GI Bill author yes yeah I, I, absolutely I pointed that out yeah <laughs> something like that yeah that's because right now that's kind of gr almost grandfathered right now they've changed the right. rules exactly yeah. okay okay well, with that, we'll put it on the the agenda in two weeks and see if we have any more comment about it. And sure. it, there is, is there any timeline that we're looking at? We, uh, <coughs> it would be uh, nice. There, what, what's the date of the uh, park dedication? Park Scott. Okay. Madam Chairwoman, uh, to uh, Mr. Flanders' request, the park official date of the dedication is actually June twenty second. So we're holding that to just shortly before we do the official unveiling on July 2nd that Mr. Fry, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Fry is coordinating the whole avenue. So this will give us a chance on the 22nd of June to celebrate the completion of the park. We would obviously, if there's an opportunity to make the official announcement, whatever would be determined before then, that's super. If not, we'll be honored to do it at any time that would work at your convenience. So Which would give us and we can plan on, on bringing it forth a week before. Okay. For discussion and if that if that works to the council yes yeah. mm -hmm. okay. well if there's no motion needed for us to I mean we've we've viewed it and yeah I think that if we I don't know what the time frame is if we pass a motion in two weeks then mm -hmm. it would be placed yes on the next council agenda yep. that would work. Um, if, um, okay. okay thank you okay. thank you Okay, so we'll move on to discussion of tourism information in Topeka. And we've had this discussion a couple of times about the consistent or the information that is in um, our lodging establishments. And I've met with Brett a couple times about this, that we have a, um, a wonderful map that we're handing out in tablet form to the venues, and I, at one at the first meeting that we discussed this, we even discussed. I think Councilman Jensen brought up the idea of a app that people could download that would take them to visit Topeka yeah. and, and that type of thing, which was a very uh, notable idea. And but it would take a lot of you know work to get that done and stuff. So, in that discussion, we've had what you know what is going to happen with the map and how it's um, put out to the, the uh, vent. my concern then was I started visiting as TGT chair some of the venues that we have for tourist attractions and um, talked with the um, leaders there and found out that yes, that we, it would be nice. We depend upon these cards that they all put out and even at the library we have some of the that tourism venues they have cards out but we don't have anything that's consistent and uniform that say you go to the capitol and you pick this up and it tells you where where to go in topeka and what sure. to see and what to do and that type of thing so brett i'd like you to come up and kind of just give us an update on and then mary handed me and i didn't realize this as um, being on the committee for a while either that we do have um it's a required to have a report um it's uh, tourist attractions on or before June 1st, 2016. Um, Visit Topeka Incorporated will present a report to the Transient Guest Tax Committee concerning the practices of Topeka hotels and motels with regard to the dissemination of information concerning tourist attractions, printed materials in lobby or individual rooms, dissemination through other media in comparison to the practices of hotels and motels in Manhattan, Kansas City, Kansas, Wichita, Lawrence, and Salina. As part of its presentation of this report, VTI will submit uh, recommendations related to measures that could be used for the purpose of encouraging Topeka hotels and motels to engage the pra best practices available in promoting tourist attractions in Topeka. So this was new to me. I don't know, Brett, have you 
have you, did you know this was in um, exactly, where is that, Mary? It's in the contract with DPL. Okay, so it's actually in the contract. So since you're gonna be at the council meeting to, to give us the annual report update, I assume that you'll be meeting this, but it will be after July, June 1st. We sent that report and study to uh, the Transit Guest Tax Committee members as well as six of the city staff back at the first week of March that we completed that study. Okay, and do, can you remind me what it looked like because it, I don't remember seeing it. Um, it was three pages long. It was essentially a self-assessed Q&A of the, the questions that were brought up about what other cities are doing and the pros and cons of, of uh, information in hotel rooms and what other cities are doing and how we differ from them and things that we are uh, either doing different than them in a positive way or things that we are planning on doing different from other cities. Okay. If we could send it again and then put it on the agenda for the next the meeting, the meeting in two weeks so that we can actually publicly present that. Um, and what's going on and, and uh, the comparisons. Okay. So, I will say that Brett, when we met the other day, Brett said that they are really, this is the map that I, and Councilman Emerson, I don't know if you've seen it yet. I have not, thank you. But that map is the one piece of paper that really brings about what there is to do in Topeka. And that's what my encouragement has been to utilize this map, whether it's an app or whether it's, you know, by um, putting it on in, in the hotels and the motels, but also at the sites themselves. Because we have people that walk to the top of the Capitol, they'll see the flags across with Overland Station, but they have no idea what those flags are sure, there for. Sure. Um, so those are th things. And I, I just feel like with this is a discussion that needs to continue um, and we need to hear reports about what, what Visit Topeka is doing. So first off, regarding the app, there, there is an app in development. It has been in development for a few months and it will go live around July 1st. Okay. And it is tied to uh, both our visittopeka.com website as well as the events page, topeka365.com. And it is location based. So wherever you are in the city, if you can pull the app up, it will show you restaurants and attractions from uh, closest to you going out. Uh, there are, uh, there will be built in itineraries on there as well. So people can go and say, uh, I'm right here. What's the closest attraction? And they can find an itinerary that suits that attraction. And then it will give them a flow around the city of, of where to go next as well. Um, as far as the maps, we just received uh, about a week and a half ago, our new shipment of visitor's guides for the year. Uh, those maps uh, will be going out with the visitor's guides to attractions and to hotels. And then in addition, we're also working on some other aspects of marketing promotional materials for some of the heritage tourism sites that those apps, uh, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the maps will be going to those places as well. So it just takes a lot of coordination there. there are uh, 80,000 visitors guides that showed up at our doorstep the other day. So it takes a lot of coordination to get those out to, to everybody. But hopefully by the end of June, we will have uh, the maps and visitors guides in all of the attractions, heritage tours and sites and hotels in the city. Okay. And Councilman Emerson, this is the Visit Topeka oh, thank you. guide. Okay. So I'm gonna give that uh -huh. to you, to thank kind you. Of, yes, to look at. when. Brett came to the council meeting that was honoring the um, National Tourism Week. Uh -huh. um, he presented us all with a folder of, of uh, what's going on with Topeka and, and uh, their, uh, here, I'm just gonna give you the whole folder. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Do you want it back or? Uh, uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, I bet I can get more if I need it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, okay. Madam Mayor, I have a yes. how, how do businesses get on the map, how do they, you know, do, do are they do they just request to be listed there and then they are, they're approved or? Uh, I don't know if I would go that far. You know, the, the maps are. Uh, we we try to get the whole uh, city limits on there, and then the 
the, the dots, so to speak, are, uh, are big, so we are limited on what we can put on there um, so it doesn't have confusion. But essentially what we try to do is we try to look at any, any place that is open for tours and attractions and are things that um, we try to take a generic approach, I guess you could say. And if, if someone came up to a hotel employee and asked what, what is there for us to do today and it's something – that a hotel feels that this is an attraction that people can go to, either paid or free, to go see and experience something about the city, then we try to ensure that that's on that map. Yep. Like all yeah. the restaurants yeah. would be now, included? Or? The, on the back side of the map, there are a lot more places that, that are uh, that talked about with the address than what are actually on the map itself. Well, like I said, we didn't want to fill the whole map up where you actually couldn't see the boundaries okay. of the city or the streets. Um, Brett, when you when you come and give the report or you know talk about the 2015 report, um, one of the things the questions that I had was to um, make sure that any money that that the city's giving out, you know, either in the bid fund or um, that we, the visit Topeka gives out, that we have it listed on the number of tr attractions. And this will, this is the report from, that he gave us for 2015. If you look back at the 2014 attraction attendance numbers and the 2015 attraction attendance numbers, um, it shows, and, and I really appreciate you putting it in the attraction numbers by um, the highest, and the highest was 311,000 people that came to the zoo last year. Um, and then we had 90,000 at Old Prairie Town, 85,000 at Kansas Discovery Center, 81,000 at the state capitol, compared to 311,000 at the zoo. Um, I've had a couple people ask me, you know, how we're tracking these numbers, and I was under the assumption that, that you're depending upon the attractions themselves to give you these numbers. Um, is that correct? Yes, one of, my, one of my staff, they call on a monthly basis. Uh, depending on the location, they have different arrangements. Some of them email directly, some of them the, the employee goes in and looks at their computer, some of them they just call up and, and give us those numbers. But we, it's uh, very difficult for us to gauge how many people are going to some of these, so we really rely on the attraction itself. And, and right. we have a, a process where once a month we're updating that list. And we, you and I talked about adding Sunflower Soccer since we hit, you know, they are getting quite a bit of city yeah. money. We, we added Sunflower Soccer, um, Jayhawk Theater, and Constitution Hall, three uh, organizations that are receiving transit air tax dollars. Great. Okay. Any, any other questions? No. Okay. I do have... Uh, This, uh, this is essentially all the money that we gave out last year for the bid fund. And if you look at uh, the second column where it says paid, we, we paid out $87,000 uh, to different organizations out of the bid fund. The columns on the right side show what that return on investment would be. So some of the highlights would be with that $87,000, we were able to pick up 12,800 hotel room nights into the city from different events that we bid on. Uh, the attendance of those events were almost 38,000 attendees. And the direct spending for those, which direct spending is hotel sales plus our attendance spending, which is $50 per person per day, that is a national average, uh, that was $3.1 million. So we gave out $87,000 to bring $3.1 million into the city. These are events that would not have came to Topeka if we were not able to have that money and bid on those events. We were competing against other cities uh, for, for these events. And uh, one other number of note would be hotel sales tax dollars. Brought that $87,000 brought in $315,000 worth of sales tax dollars. 
as well. So the bid fund is working and uh, we have a couple large events that we're working on right now that would require the highest ever expenditure that we have ever given out for one event for the bid fund. But those events would also be, uh, one of them would be the largest event to ever come to Topeka. So wow. we're, we're uh, in a fight right now with some other cities. It takes a lot of work to do some of these bids and these proposals. But, but if we were to get this uh, event would be a great uh, example of how that bid fund works. The return on investment for that money would be over 300% is what we would bring. Wow. Is there anything any of us can do to help you? Um, Right now, uh, you know, my staff, I think they've, they're pretty good at looking at um, organizations around the community. The, the, we, we, to be able to do a lot of these events, we partner with different groups, whether it's a ball team or, or Parks and Rec or a company. And if they have some, some knowledge of how to do something, we, we definitely look at, at people to help us out. Uh, a lot of times, uh, those organizations, when they're looking at different cities, their uh, final determination is, who has the most volunteers that have the institutional knowledge of what we're trying okay. to do, whether it's a, uh, a softball tournament, looking at a, uh, a local club team that puts on large tournaments that says we will help facilitate running this ball tournament, or, or a business uh, that uh, if it is a convention involving uh, construction, if uh, a, a construction company come forward and say we can, we can help with some of the training materials and stuff like that. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, the soccer, is, is soccer part of, s soccer and NHRA, that's, I wanted to ask about those two entities as far as um, getting them to come to Topeka, how we get them and if they've been part of the bid fund. They have not. Uh, so Sunflower Soccer, run, they run their two large Governor's Cup, the Governor's Cup of Spring and the Governor's Cup Fall tournaments. Okay. And those tournaments uh, are uh, homegrown tournaments. Uh, there are tournaments that, uh, you know, Sunflower Soccer themselves is creating. Uh, so that is not something that we would um, uh, open up to the bid fund because it's not, we're not competing against another city for that okay. tournament. This is something here. Same with, uh, same with Heartland Park and NHRA. That is something that, that uh, the Heartland Park ownership has spent money to make the track specific so they can bring in an NHRA race and uh, we're not competing with that race over another city. And I can't remember, Brett, because it's been a while since I looked at the annual report. Do you cover <coughs> the numbers by the NHRA coming here and also with the Governor's Cup? I mean, I, I would hope that our, in the future, our Visit Topeka annual report is really gonna talk about everything that we have recreational or entertainment-wise that comes to Topeka. We keep track of uh, as many large events as possible, and some, sometimes it's difficult, uh, but we, we will uh, communicate with the Lodging Association on how many room nights they have, and even sometimes that's difficult because not every person that's going to be staying in a hotel next or this weekend for NHRA is here just for those races. So right. what we'll do is we'll look at a lot of historical data. Uh, what did the week this same weekend look like last year when the race wasn't here and kind of compare and contrast with, with <coughs> what the rates were and how many how many individuals. A and that goes the same with hotel conventions as well. If it's a large uh, city convention at the Expo Center at one of the two larger convention hotels, we will communicate with them how many room nights that they have, how many attendees uh, as well. And so try to gauge how, uh, how profitable uh, a different uh, a certain event is because that helps my sales staff determine what events they're going to continue to try to go after. They will obviously want to go after the ones that are going to get the biggest bang for our buck. And the other thought I had or the question is, um, I know we had ESPN here for the horseshoe contest. Mm -hmm. How many times do we get ESPN <coughs> to Topeka? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was the first time okay. and mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's the last time, but that was a, um, ESPN is a huge, huge Good monster, thing. and that yeah. had nothing. I would love to take credit for that, or <laughs> anybody for, in Topeka to take credit for that. But that was uh, that was very, very lucky and fortunate on Topeka's part that uh, the same year they decided to do this on the road uh, Americana mm -hmm. tour, we just happened yeah. to have the World Horseshoe Tournament coming to town. Yeah. The Horseshoe Tournament didn't even know that they were going to be coming. It just 
happened is they, they wanted to do that event during the summer and they started looking at um, lifestyle events like horseshoes and it was in Topeka and they decided to come to Topeka. Awesome. And I, 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 you know, I would like to see things like that in your report. I mean, it, and if that's something that we can actually encourage visitors to, and once we get Evil Knievel going, that's going to be another attraction mm -hmm. that uh, uh, hopefully we'll get more TV media or water national media. We're depending on depending on uh, the size of an event, uh, so so with Evil Knievel, for instance, we will reach out to to um, regional and national media to, to let them know what's going on to see if, if that's something they would be interested about. I know with, with the Evil Knievel announcement, we have reached out to a couple of the larger sports radio stations, uh, radio stations in Kansas City, uh, to see if that's something that would be of interest to them to, to come and do the show here or at least talk about it a little bit as, as some advertising. It is, you know, Evil Knievel is uh, sporting, uh, sure. and, and so that's something that might pique their listeners uh, for sure. Keep up the great work. We're, we're going to be on many maps that, you know, uh, in the years to come, especially with some of the things that we've got coming. Thank so, you. Thank you. Is there anything else that needs to come before the committee? Okay. I think we're adjourned then. Thank you. Thank you.